One of the questions I get asked by entrepreneurs all the time is when is the right time to raise money for their startup? Stick to the end and I'll tell you why getting the timing right is crucial for your business. So the first thing is I recommend to pretty much every entrepreneur wait as long as possible, but not longer. And what I mean by that is oftentimes I meet with entrepreneurs and those entrepreneurs will be like, hey, I really need to raise money in order to achieve X, Y, Z thing. Like if I only had money, I could go hire somebody amazing. Or I, only if I had money, I could land this great customer. If only I had money, I could build this great product. And my feedback to them is that I don't think that that's actually true most of the time. Most of the time, you can use your resources that you already have to achieve incredible things. On other videos, I've talked about my friend who wanted to launch a watch business. Now, he was a student, he had like no money, came from a disadvantaged background, and yet he figured out a way to raise money. What he did is he went and he found some pictures, he went to Alibaba, he designed some product, and then he took that product and he put it on Kickstarter, and he didn't even have a product and he raised a bunch of money on Kickstarter in order to start his business, right? He didn't need to raise money from equity investors or venture capitalists or any of that business. I have another friend, he didn't even do that. He just set up a website and he put a bunch of pictures up there. And so it cost him like, you know, less than a hundred bucks. And he set up all these websites, he tested a bunch of things, he identified products that would work. And then once he had that, then he could go to investors and say, hey, look, I've got all this data that says that people will buy the product and I know it's real because they've actually gone and put money down to try and buy it, buy my product and I had to refund them the money. That's a really strong signal, right? Another example is I know companies have landed letters of intent with large companies where they've gone to the company and said, hey, here's our solution. We can't quite deliver it to you yet, but will you write us a letter that says that you would be a customer if we could start deploying it? And you can even push it a step further where sometimes entrepreneurs have gotten companies to actually invest in the company or give them a huge purchase order. For example, I know this one company where they went to one of their potential customers and said, hey, do you want this really amazing product? And that company, that customer was like, oh yes, we definitely want it. And so this company told the customer, okay, great. How about we give you a killer deal for the next three years if you pay up all up front? And so the customer did, they took that money, built the product and then delivered it back to the customer. And now they have this product and so, and a huge like, you know, marquee customer and they leverage those two things to go out and sell to more customers. So there are a lot of different ways to do this. Uh, you, you don't always have to raise money right out of the gate. And here's the thing, and, and this is why it's important. If you can wait as long as possible and you can just do these hard things, and don't get me wrong, they are incredibly hard things to do. Whether it's finding somebody that could be your co-founder to build the product with their technical chops, or it's landing that customer, or it's, you know, whatever it is, like these are hard things. But here's the thing, if you can do the hard things, then you can convince investors like me to trust you with my money. Because I know you've already done some hard things and that you are somebody that's very high caliber that can continue to go through walls and do whatever it takes to make the business successful. And those are the types of entrepreneurs that VCs love to invest in. And the benefit to you is not only will it be easier, but you'll raise at a larger valuation. Why is that important? Well, the bigger your valuation, the less of your company you give up. And by inference of that, the less control you give up. So for example, if you don't have anything, anything at all, other than like a cool idea, you're not gonna be able to raise at a very high valuation, which means if I as an investor come in and give you money, I'm gonna want like a huge stake of the business. I mean, watch Shark Tank recently. The companies that are very, very early and don't have a lot of traction, man, they don't get valuations that even break a million bucks, right? The, the you know, Mr. Wonderful's coming in and he's like, I want half the business for like a hundred grand. And you contrast that with some of the businesses that come on stage that are doing really well and have built a great business. They're able to demand really high valuations from the sharks because they're not as risky of a business. And so the shark doesn't need to own as much of the business in order to justify making the investment. But I did say, wait as long as possible, but not longer. And the reason for that is because you don't wanna run out of money. You wanna make sure that you've got enough runway in order to raise the money. And if you're gonna raise venture capital, you should plan on probably at least six months. So 
if you're just starting the business today and you know that in six months you're probably gonna need to raise money, even if you do all the hard things, then you should probably start today to start having those conversations and building those relationships so that you can kind of accelerate that process so that at the end of six months, you're already there and you're not just starting. All right, so let's talk about some of the milestones you need to hit in order to raise money from different types of investors. And this is important because it'll help you figure out the timing of when you go to whom. So if you're pre-seed, pre-seed is anything from like an idea on a napkin to basically a finished MVP, minimum viable product. That's what pre-seed is all about. It's basically like get a product built and on the market. And once you have achieved that and you, then the difference between pre-seed and seed is whether or not you have a customer. So with pre-seed, it's all about whether you raise it from yourself, from friends and family, from other angel investors, from pre-seed funds, which are now just like popping up, which kind of blows my mind. Basically, you take that capital, you build the product, then go get a couple customers. The more customers you have, the better and easier it will be to raise money from seed stage investors. Those seed stage investors get excited once you have demonstrated at least a few customers, at least a few dollars in the door to say like, hey, I am solving an indie error and somebody's willing to pay me to solve that need for them. Then seed stage is all about, okay, you're solving a need for somebody, but can you take that from solving it for one person or a couple people into solving it for an entire market? And can you have the right features and product mix and story and so on and so forth that you start to fill this pull on your product where people are coming to you and they're saying, hey, I wanna buy this because it solves a pain point for me, right? If you think about this, the, the vitamin painkiller example that we've talked about in other videos, what you wanna do is you wanna be the painkiller, right? You want people going to the store hunting for your painkiller product because they're in so much pain and they need it taken care of right now, right? Versus the vitamin, which is just kind of like, yeah, it's nice to have a at Costco. Yeah, I'll grab some vitamins, throw them in the, the bin, right? Maybe, maybe not. We'll see, right? It's a totally different dynamic. And so from an entrepreneur perspective, you want to be like the painkiller. And once you start to fill all these customers coming in from all different areas to buy your product and, and, and get it from you to solve their pain point, you'll start to achieve this idea of product market fit. Now, generally, venture capitalists are looking for you to have somewhere between one and $3 million in revenue from a variety of different customers within your core market. That's you know the, the unspoken rule, if you will, for when a company has started to signal that they have real product market fit. Cause you know, like a million dollars of revenue is, is like, it's a substantial amount of money, but hopefully there's a long way to go from there uh, and a pathway where you can be generating hundreds, if not billions of dollars in revenue. So that's where Series A venture capitalist investors will, will start to play and start making investments is once you've achieved that, that idea of product market fit and you've got, you know, you're solving the problem for these customers and they are just excited and demanding the product from you. With that capital from your Series A investors, you're going to leverage that to build out your marketing strategies, your sales strategies and so forth so that you have a, like a replicatable way of pushing the product uh, to customers and getting in front of them. That's really what all the Series A is about, is really honing in on that sales and marketing motion. Series B is all about like, hey, we figured this out and we've got good metrics. So, you know, we're, we know that we can sell the product for more than it costs us to make the product. That's a really good one. And that people keep coming back and buying more from us. If you can show those two things, that you're able to sell the product efficiently and that people keep coming back and buying more, then you've probably been able to demonstrate that your marketing engine and your sales motion is working. And at that point, the Series B investors will be interested in putting more money into the company because for them, they want to put more fuel on the fire. And then it's the same with Series C, Series D, Series E, et cetera. Sometimes people are confused about the nomenclature of Series A, Series B, et cetera. All it is is a reference to the types of shares that investors are investing in the company. So is this idea of Series A preferred shares. It's just the name of the shares. Uh, and the preferred piece of it is that as venture investors, when we invest in companies, we oftentimes want to have preferred shares because it allows us to tie certain rights to those shares, unlike common shares, which are by, by their name common, right? Like they're the same for everybody. 
we want something slightly different that gives us different rights. And you can watch some of my other videos where I talk about like why it is that way and how they're structured and what some of those rights are. Going back to the beginning, I talked about how getting the timing right was really important. It's really important because it can have a huge impact on your valuation. Just as I mentioned earlier, the longer you wait, and by the wait, I mean not that you're just sitting on your hands doing nothing, but the longer that you're out there achieving hard things without raising money, and the further you can push that out, the more revenues you can generate, the more all-star, rock star employees you can hire, the more you know name brand customers you can land, whatever it might be for your particular business, the better off you'll be when it comes to fundraising. Because what happens in, from the investor mindset is that I want to reduce risk, right? I'm trying to generate a huge home run return, which means I want risk because you don't get huge returns without risk, right? And so the, you basically have these two levers. One is valuation and one is risk. And the riskier the investment, the lower the valuation has to be so that I can generate a bigger return. So let's say I have two companies. I have one that's really, really, really risky, and I have another one that's a, a little less risky. Still lots of risk, but a little less risky. Well, in my mind, I might look at them and say, you know, the risk of company A of going out of business is so high that the only way I would do this deal is if I felt like I could possibly generate 100 times return my investment. Whereas this company B, it's super risky, but not as risky as company A. And so because it's a lower risk, I'd be willing to pay more, but I still want like a 10 times return on my investment. Well, in that case, if I think that the overall potential outcome of both companies A and B is $100 million, then that means the valuation on company A, if I need 100 times my investment, is only going to be a $1 million, whereas company B could be worth 10 times that at a $10 million valuation. What does that mean if you're the entrepreneur? Well, if I come in and I say your business is only worth a million bucks, right? and you need a million dollars in order to kind of achieve your next milestone, I'm gonna take half your business. Whereas in company B, if you need a million bucks to achieve your next milestone, I, that million bucks is only gonna cost you roughly 10% of your business. So you can see, you know, one, how much you're gonna give up, but the other is like, if it's super risky, I'm gonna to wanna to watch that investment very closely, which means I'm gonna want a board seat, I'm gonna to wanna to watch everything you do, I'm gonna have lots of protective provisions and, and rights that let me control the business, right? So there are a lot of like potential negatives. And so that's why it's in your best interest to wait as long as possible to raise money from venture capitalists because it will put you in a better position of strength. But like I said earlier, don't wait too long. Make sure you have enough time to actually pull the round together. And so sometimes what I see entrepreneurs doing is they'll start the fundraising process when they're about ready to close like a big customer. And they expect or really hope that that customer will close while they're in the fundraising process. So they can start having the conversations. They can say, hey, yeah, we've got this huge customer that's about to close, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then once the customer closes, Right, then it becomes this inflection point for valuation because they've now de-risked the business substantially. Venture capitalists get more excited, they're more willing to invest and invest at higher valuations, and they're able to get it round closed quickly. If this was helpful, check out my other video where I talk about what you should expect when raising money from a venture capitalist and what that whole process looks like and the pros and cons. Thanks.